Hello, welcome to Microfiche Microphone. I'm Micah, and on this channel we look at microfiche from the past, old newspaper articles in the public domain. We look at them with our modern eyes, our modern perspective, and see what we can learn from them. In this microfiche time capsule, we are looking at the Ladies Home Journal from October 1901, and this article is entitled Untold Stories of an Eccentric Man. I have no idea who they're going to be talking about, so I am interested to find out and uh, see if any of these stories are things that I've heard of or not. So um, let's find out together. Yeah. The most picturesque figure in American art today is James Abbott McNeil Whistler. All the eccentricity of genius is highly developed in this little man of five foot seven. After painting for 50 years and scoffing at his fellow artists who taught, he suddenly, at the age of 73, surprised all who knew him by announcing his intention of becoming the associate teacher of Frederick McMonnies, the famous young sculptor in the studio of Madame Vitti in Paris. The announcements were hardly printed before the studio was filled to its limit, and 60 young women, mostly Americans, awaited the coming of their world-renowned master. The stories concerning the great painter that have gone the rounds of the papers for 40 years or more were anything but comforting to the girls. They say he hates girls and does not approve of their studying art, ventured a small blonde from behind a large palette. I am afraid he will not come more than once. You know, he never does anything he does not like to do, and is apt to do anything at any time. You can tell that from his books. At eleven o'clock came a gentle knock on the studio door, and in response to Madame Vitry's entree, a small man, clad in long Prince Albert coat and a student's tall hat, appeared. He nodded to the class, placed his stick in a corner, and very leisurely proceeded to remove his hat and a pair of black gloves. He was as calm as if he had spent his life in a classroom. He was much shorter than the average of his pupils. He wore a white, turned-down collar, and for a necktie he had a strip of two-inch black ribbon that had been cut through the center. The edges were raveled, and the ends hung halfway to his waist. His famous white lock, which is two inches from his forehead and directly over his right eye, was tied up with a jaunty little bow of narrow black ribbon. The general aspect of the man was grotesque and suggestive of caricature, but the face was strong, masterly, and fine of feature. It revealed no trace of the whistler best known to the public. His expression was slightly melancholy, but keen, active, and changeable. Above all, his face was serious, spiritually serious, and intently full of purpose. He was afterward described by one of the pupils as a clean, neat little old gentleman with a quiet, gentle manner. As he began to criticize, an amused smile, which he seemed to be trying to avoid, played around his lips. Each canvas that he lifted from the easel he brought within six inches of his face, and beginning at one corner, examined it carefully, inch by inch. Ooh, sounds like he's losing his eyesight. The first half dozen he put back without a word. The seventh he examined in the same way, and then looking at the owner, said, American? Yes. Whom did you study with? Mr. Chase? What did he say about me? Here appeared the first touch of the vain, self-conscious whistler. Okay, this is weird. It's like broken in between by a picture. Very dark picture. It's hard to see. Beginning with the first pupil, he asked, Whom have you studied with? The girl gave the names of her former instructors, and Mr. Whistler said, Ah, so much the better. Then he turned to the second pupil and asked in the same manner, Whom have you studied with? He listened to the reply and said as before, Ah, so much the better. He put the same question to each member of the class, and whatsoever the reply was, the same, ah, so much the better. Finally, he came to a girl who replied, I never had an instructor. I never have taken any lessons or received help from anyone. Ah, so very much the better, said the, was the instant reply. <laughs> One day a pupil offended him. Later in the day, she received a polite little note, signed by Mr. Whistler, requesting her not to appear in the classroom again, in one corner was drawn one of the dainty little butterflies which were always the feature of the artist's correspondence. The girl thought it was a joke and told some of the students that a butterfly note from Mr. Whistler was so rare that it was worthwhile being expelled for. The story reached Mr. Whistler's ear and he remarked, Well, they shall all have a note some day. Shortly afterwards, he resigned from the school. Okay, this doesn't sound like eccentricity so much as like kind of a, a very interesting kind of a person, but... Uh, I don't know. So far, there's nothing, like, majorly strange about what he's doing. A student once handed Mr. Whistler a very broadly painted canvas on which the brush strokes were very apparent. He examined it carefully and asked, From what did you paint this study? 
from the model now posing, replied his pupil. I do not see any brush strokes on the model, do you? said the artist. <laughs> okay, that's kind of rude because there is a, definitely a technique where you can see the brush strokes. You know, just because he doesn't use the same technique as you, you know. Another time, Mr. Whistler picked up a canvas before his class unconsciously drifted into a talk on art. Suddenly he halted and asked, Do you know what I mean when I say tone, value, light and shade, quality, movement, con construction, etc.? Oh yes, Mr. Whistler confidently replied a number of the girls. I'm glad, replied the little man, for it's more than I do. Once Mr. Whistler took some students to one of the large galleries. He walked slowly ahead of them and suddenly stopped in front of the famous painting by Millet. That, he said, pointing to the canvas, was painted for the public. I wonder how Millet would feel if he knew that Whistler was looking at it. <sighs> Why, did they have like a rivalry or something? I'm going to have to look this up afterwards because I'm, I'm not familiar with this artist. I've, of course, of course, heard Mr. Whistler, like, but the only thing I think of is Mr. Whistler's mother. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's like one of his famous portraits. I don't know. A fellow artist who had just met Mr. Whistler was heard to remark that he could see no reason why people did not get along more amicably with the American genius. Before long, they had a falling out and separated in great heat. The next day, the artist called on Whistler and said, Now don't let us quarrel, Mr. Whistler. You quarrel with all of your friends. And why should I make you the exception? Snapped Mr. Whistler, and he left the room. <laughs> now that's cute. That's funny. Mr. Whistler was invited to spend a few days with Alma T uh, Tadima. On the night of his arrival, Alma Tadima announced that he intended to give a breakfast next morning. There will be a number of ladies present, Mr. Whistler. I keep saying Mr. It doesn't always say Mr. Okay. There will be a number of ladies present, Whistler, he said, and I want you to pull yourself together and look your best. All right, said Whistler. In the next morning, Whistler's voice was heard ringing through the magnificent halls of the Tadima mansion. Tadima, Tadima, I want you, Tadima. Thinking of nothing less than fire, Alma Tadima rushed to the room to, of his guest. For heaven's sake, Whistler, what's the matter? You've waked up everyone in the house. What is it? Oh, don't get so excited, Tadima, drawled Whistler. I only wanted to know where you kept the scissors to trim the fringe of cuffs with. I thought you wanted me to pull myself together for the ladies. While the artist was trying on a hat in a London shop one day, a customer rushed in, Mistaking Mr. Whistler for a clerk, exclaimed, I say, this at does not fit. The artist eyed him for a moment and then replied scornfully, Neither does your coat, and I'll be hanged if I like the color of your trousers. Upon one occasion, when Whistler went away for a summer's painting, he reached his destination and found that his canvases had not arrived. He became very much excited and tore up and down the station, shouting to the guards. Have you lost anything? asked the station master. Lost anything? Why, my Kansases have not come, screamed Whistler. Were they valuable? inquired the man. Not yet, not yet, said Whistler, and while his ready wit in this case was likely lost on the station master, there is no story that the artist likes better than to tell. <laughs> okay. It is doubtful whether the artist will ever appreciate the best story about himself to the same extent that his friends and enemies do. Those who have read Mr. Whistler's Gentle Art of Making Enemies will recall that the author spoke of a portrait of himself as a monstrous lampoon painted by an American. <laughs> this referred to Mr. William M. Chase's famous portrait of the genius. During the past winter, Mr. Chase has been exhibiting this portrait with a collection of his pictures in many cities in the United States catalog, A Monstrous Lampoon, Portrait of James Abbott McNeil Whistler. All right. <laughs> So, a little bit to unpack there. Yeah, there's there, there's definitely some funny, eccentric kinds of stories, but he sounds like a very temperamental person. Like something happens and he kind of goes a little crazy, yeah? Um, you need to calm down there, dude. But, uh, uh, yeah. All right, let's look, up, look him up on Wikipedia, yeah? James Whistler. James Abbott McNeil Whistler. RBA was an American painter active during the American Gilded Age and based primarily in the United Kingdom. Interesting. I didn't know that. Okay. So he was born in 1834 and died in 1903. So at this point he was still alive, but he was at the very tail end of his life. And he had quite a long life, yeah. Um, died age 69. So I guess it wasn't that long, but it was, you know, for the age it was long. 
His signature for his paintings to the shape of a stylized butterfly possessing a long stinger for a tail. Okay. That's what she meant by a butterfly painting, yeah? The symbol combined both aspects of his personality. His art is marked by a subtle delicacy where his public persona was combative. Yeah, they did mention that, yeah, that he was always fighting with people. He found a parallel between painting and music and entitled many of his paintings Arrangements, Harmonies, and Nocturnes, emphasizing the primacy of tonal harmony. His most famous painting, Arrangement in Gray and Black Number 1, commonly known as Whistler's Mother, yes, I, that's what I thought, it's the only one I could think of, is a revered and often parodied portrait of motherhood. Whistler influenced the art world and the broader culture of his time and his, with his theories and his friendships with other leading artists and writers. Okay. There you go. I'm not going to read all about his life, but uh, there's some pictures and stuff. I'm hoping to um, be able to save some of these pictures so I can show them to you. So if I do, I will definitely do that. Early career. Nocturnes. Interesting. I think it's interesting that he equated himself with the, with the musician. Yeah. There's Whistler's mother. Arrangement in gray and black, number one. Interesting that he considered that a black and white because it's not black and white. You can see some skin tone on the mother's face and and the um, block that the mother's feet are resting on. Oh, here's a picture, an actual portrait, a uh, photograph of uh, Whistler's mother. It's interesting. It's actually, it's pretty accurate, you know? Have the same bonnet on. Anyways. Um, it's funny that he criticized the student for having brush strokes in his painting when it's you can clearly see certain like some brush strokes in some of his paintings. Um, not always if that's not what he was going for, but like that's really interesting. So I feel like he was overly critical of others, yeah, for things that maybe he annoyed him about his own paintings. Like, well, like some of them you can't see the brush strokes as well, but like, and some of them, they're really obvious. So I'm not sure. Oh, here we go. Whistler by William Merritt Chase from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'll definitely show you this one as well. This is really interesting. Um, looks like several of his uh, paintings as well as his own portrait ended up on postage stamps. But um, yeah, eccentric person. I think that's a safe way to say it, although they didn't introduce it very well in the article. Uh, it, it did come across near the end um, that he was quite a, an annoying person <laughs> and that he disparaged himself. He was always like, you know, uh, you know, a little self-deprecating, um, which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing in this case, but uh, it's just interesting that somebody so famous would end up being self-deprecating. But, you know, hey, whatever floats your boat. Um, so there you go, James Abbott McNeil Whistler. I found that quite interesting. I hope you enjoyed the microfiche time capsule today, and uh, I hope to see you in the next video. Like the video, subscribe to the channel.